Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Isn't he good? Hallelujah. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Woo, you can join me if you want to. Hallelujah. I'm having my own little Holy Ghost party. Amen. Started when I got here, got on my knees, hasn't stopped since. Amen. I'm not pacing myself today. Hey, hallelujah. I've been praising the Lord since I got here. How'd you like that confession of faith? Come on now. I am now releasing my faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. This could be my last time. I'm not going to lollygag. I'm not going to half step. I have too many things. I can't speak for you. But do you know how many Sundays God has given me a voice to preach? Do you know how many times? I, I might feel some aches and pains during the week. God performs a miracle every Sunday. Do you hear me? Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Normally on a normal day, I get up and the first thing I do is thank God for waking me up. Thank him for the day. I thank him for my family. I thank him for my children. I thank him for you all. I thank him for this place. I thank him for the purpose. And then I stretch. Ha <laughs> ha. You get a certain age, you realize you, you need to stretch. But you know, on Sundays, I get up, it's time to go. I don't have the time to stretch. And do you know, I, on Sundays, what God does for me, what he does with this body? Amen? Amen. And, and, I, and I believe that he's going to give me the wherewithal to give you all that I was supposed to give you. And I got to praise him all morning. And I got to praise him all morning. And I got to sing the songs as if I'm the choir. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. And I got to say the confession of faith like I really want to say it. And I get to give you his word. You notice what I said? And I what? Get to give you his word. Amen. Hallelujah. It cannot be a drudgery. I am grateful for this place. I am grateful for this purpose. And I am grateful for these people. Amen. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful to you. And I just thank God. Amen. You may be seated. I have you standing up too long. Hallelujah. Are we online, Brother Marcellus? Amen. Hallelujah. So I want to welcome all of you who are uh, joining us online. You know, I'm going to write some names down because I feel bad. I want to, I want to name some names. There's some folks that have been with us faithfully since we started this online ministry uh, with the pandemic. And sir, I just, uh, I'll leave somebody's name out, but you know, I don't want to hurt any feelings. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But boy, obviously I, we, we love uh, Mom Milth. Amen. Hallelujah. Mom, I hope you're watching this morning. We, we love you. We know you're going through some things, but you are still our mother. Amen? Amen. Is she not our mother like Dad Lee was our dad? Hallelujah. She is the mother of this house no matter where she's partaking. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. There's so many other names that come to my mind, uh, but I, I'll, I'll mess it up if I start going through the list. So I'll leave it. If I leave it at Mom and Dad Lee, right? Mom Milton and Dad Lee, I'm okay, right? I'm safe. I'm safe. Hallelujah. But all of you who have continued to join us on Sundays, just know that I notice I get the list every Sunday. And, um, and I know many of you watch us uh, partake during the week or later on in the day on Sunday. And we're grateful uh, to all of you. And I just want to say yet again that I'm grateful to each and every person that I'm laying eyes on this morning and those who are in the nursery. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't want to leave anybody out. And so we're still, by the way, also praying for those who are on the prayer list. And I don't believe we have any additions. And so that's a blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't think we have any additions to 
the prayer list. I told you last week that we were about to start up the nursing home ministry again, and we are so close. We're about to set the dates that we're going to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to start out one Saturday a month. We used to do two Saturdays. We actually used to do three every other, and then we, they, they needed us to make some adjustments, so we did, I think it was the second and the fourth, and we're going to get this thing started. We just have to figure out which Saturday we're going to go. We're also having some conversations about how to uh, start up again what was the, 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 the uh, homeless ministry, but it's not just about those who are homeless. I think we're supposed to say, what is it, house, houseless or something like that? <laughs> Unhoused, that's right, that's right, that's right. The unhoused. Because what happens is homeless had a meaning and then it turns into a label and then it turns into bias and it turns into narrow thinking and it turns into judgment and better thanism. So then we have to say unhoused. Why? To give them more dignity. Eventually, unhoused won't work anymore. We'll have to have something else. Amen? Hallelujah. But we are to care for those who are disadvantaged. Care for those who can't fully take care of themselves. Jesus called us to do this. The question is, what form will it take? It doesn't have to take the same form it always did. Situations change. Laws change. Rules, regulation, risk profiles change. And so we will make the appropriate adjustment. But what we will not do is we will not stop doing what Jesus told us to do. Amen? Amen. We might pause. We might pause. But we will not stop. So I'm looking forward to that. Look forward to uh, uh, an announcement, amen, sometime in the near future. And look forward to that announcement not coming from me. Who's that announcement coming from? Come on, now, speak up. That's right, Brother Jason. I didn't hear you, Brother Jason. Who's that announcement coming from? All right, now. Amen. We're going to give Brother Jason some screen time. <laughs> amen. Are you nervous or are you happy? He's happy, amen, because he gets to. He gets to. Hallelujah. 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 Now, there's another thing I'm grateful for this morning. Y'all just better know I have some amazing in-laws. Amen. I didn't just marry, you know, Trina Glover and make her Trina Glover Morris. Amen. And the more time goes by, I'm trying to get it to be even more Morris and, and not as, as much Glover Morris. Amen. Hallelujah. But... Let me tell you, I married into the Glover family, and it was a blessing for me. I got so many blessings as a result of that union. And so I just I want to take a moment and just let you all know how I have some amazing in-laws in general. But I'm going to highlight my mother-in-law and father-in-law, and the reason I'm doing that is because today is my father-in-law, Melvin Glover's birthday. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I don't know if he's watching right now. He probably isn't because he's faithfully and dutifully doing, you know, uh, Sunday school lessons and all that sort of stuff. And he goes to church every Sunday. So he probably won't see this this morning. He may see it later. I don't know if he's going to see it at all. But you all will know that I know that God knows that he blessed me when he connected me with Pastor Trina. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. There's so many blessings. So many blessings that the Lord gave me as a result of that choice, that decision, that uh, movement so that we can be movers and shakers for Jesus. Amen? Amen. As soon as we got married, the earthquake, you know that. Amen. Did y'all know that? Well, you thought that back in 1994, that when the earth shook on the 17th early in the morning in January, you thought that it was because of the faults right under the ground. No, it wasn't. <laughs> It was because Mike and Trina got married, and it's on now. It's on and popping. You better look. You better watch out, Satan. You better watch out. There were some miracles that happened before we could even leave the city that we went to get married in. Amen. And we got home, and the car was doing this. I was like, that's weird. That's weird. <laughs> Hallelujah. But back to serious. That, that, actually, all that was serious, but it also makes you laugh. Uh, but, I, yeah, I'm just grateful. I want to say uh, to my father-in-law, I love you, sir, and um, I appreciate you. And, uh, and I appreciate the fact that he gave me a hard time in the beginning. It wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. But, you know, he wanted to know, was this live or is this Memorex? 
<laughs> my brother-in-law, yeah, I rolled up on, in, into a place the first time I think I ever met him, or I was, certainly was around him with other people, and, uh, you know, we rode in, in Pastor Trina's car, and he was like, well, who is this dude? And how come you rolling in my, in my how come you guys rolling in her car? He, does, he, does he have his own car? What's up with that? What's up with that? Now, now if you knew me back then, you know I was rolling now. I was rolling quite nice. Hallelujah. But, but he didn't know that, so he had to check. He, he tried to check me a little bit. Amen. Hallelujah. But then when they found out what they were working with, hey, they acted like they were working with somebody who was worth while working with. I'm grateful for that. So I earned it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I earned some other things. I'm going to leave those out. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'm grateful. I'm just saying this morning, and it's recorded, so it'll be here forever, uh, as long as Facebook and as long as YouTube are here. And we also have our own recordings here, so it will be memorialized that I'm grateful for my in-laws. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. I don't want to leave. I also have a sister-in-law, just in case, you know, I mentioned my mother and father-in-law. I mentioned, you know, my brother-in-law, which most of you all know. He was Deacon Melvin. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. But I also have a sister-in-law, Cynthia, and she's something else. <laughs> she is something else. She has blackouts every now and then, those kind of blackouts where you have to look for the roadkill. But she's passionate. Amen? She's loving. She's intense. She goes hard. She doesn't half-step. Amen? Anything. She seeks excellence. And so I just had the opportunity. I took the opportunity this morning to just say what I'm grateful for, amen? amen? Hallelujah, happy birthday, dad. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. So I'm also grateful for um, the fact that so many people reached out um, last Sunday and, and last week to say that they were blessed uh, by the message last Sunday. Amen. That was awesome. And thank you, Brother Jason. I, I heard you when you were up here re-preaching the message. <laughs> Hallelujah. You let me know that you were listening. Amen. I, I thank God for that. But I'm so grateful that so many were blessed by that message. And I don't know exactly who I was talking to, or at least I didn't know at the time. Later on, but later on in the day, I got to find out a lot of folks who I was talking to. Amen. Hallelujah. I didn't know your situations, but God did. I didn't know your struggles, but God did. I didn't know what you were feeling. I didn't know what was breaking your heart. I didn't know what was having you on the verge of worry <laughs> or maybe actually worrying. I didn't know what was going from bad to worse for you, but God knew. And he showed up to let you know that he knows. And that he cares. Isn't that great? Isn't the God awesome? He is so awesome. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. And now today's message is simple. Let me hear you say simple. simple. Today's message is what? Simple. Today's message will be what? Simple. But challenging. There's something in it for all of us. In its simplicity, it will put a mirror in front of us and provide an opportunity for all of us to leave here today better than we came. Anybody game for that? Amen. Are you good with that? Amen. Hallelujah. Sister Carrie often gets up here in the opening prayer and she mentions that point that we want to be, we, 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 we want to not be offended by the message. We want to be new wineskins, able to take it in and not break and not burst not be offended. And so she mentions that often, and I pray that that's where we are this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Right. This message is simple but challenging because Jesus told us to let our lights shine. Did he not? Amen. Jesus told us to be the salt of the earth. But that means doing what Jesus wants us to do, doing what we should be doing, doing it the way that we ought to do it. 
making the difference, having the impact that we were created and called to make. Amen. And somebody say and. and all that other stuff sounds good, right? Do what we should be doing, doing it the way we should do it, making the impact that we should. And the world knowing that Jesus is the reason. Amen. The world knowing that Jesus is the inspiration behind it. Knowing that Jesus is your source. Because if your light is not shining, then the world stays dark. But if it's you that shines and not Jesus through you, then you get to be the glorious do-gooder. You get to be the successful one. As opposed to Jesus being glorified. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. When we let our light shine, we do what we should be doing. When we let our light shine, we do it exactly the way that Jesus wants us to do it. When we let our light shine, we have an impact on the world, starting with whatever is immediately around us and beyond that, according to his will. We do all of that. When our light shines, Jesus is luminous. When our light shines, the world knows Jesus is in the house. Are you with me? You may not be a sports player. Nobody may put a microphone in front of your face and give you an opportunity to say, well, I thank God for giving me the ability to perform this sport like I perform it. But you have a microphone. It may not be on TV, but you have a microphone. You have a stage. It's called your life. How are you performing on that stage? I told you it's going to be simple. Is it simple? It's straightforward. It ain't complicated. I haven't said Greek or Hebrew yet. But I bet you understand what I'm saying, right? I bet you can apply it to your own life, your own situation. You are already thinking about something (laughs) where your light is not quite so shiny, where you are not so salty, where you've been bland and dim. I said this is something for everybody, amen? Amen. Maybe for somebody especially, and I don't know who you are, so don't get self-conscious about it. But we often find ourselves falling short of letting our light shine. We fall short of being salty. And I don't mean salty as an attitude. I mean salty spiritually. Amen. Our impact on the world The world needs us and it doesn't know that it needs us. But are we supposed to wait for the world to know that it needs us in order to give the world what it needs? If Jesus waited for us to know that our main problem wasn't some enemy army, our main problem wasn't, you know, somebody disagreeing with us, our main problem wasn't needing more money, our main problem is not housing, our main problem isn't clothing, our main problem isn't food, our main need is sin removal. If he waited for us to realize that that was our main problem, you know, we'd still be heaven hell bound today. If he waited for us to have that epiphany. And so we can't wait to be invited. We can't wait to be popular as Pastor Trina was talking about. We can't wait for it to be convenient. In fact, it's becoming less and less and less convenient, less and less and less popular to do the right thing, to say the right thing, to be the right way for the right reasons, giving the right credit. Is it simple? Is it challenging? Because we all fall short in our own ways. Amen? We all leave opportunities on the table. We all can do better. Hallelujah. And so this morning, we want to focus a little bit on on that fact, but also why does it happen? And you're all going to have a chance to think about what your thing is and commit to doing something about it. What is your thing? Because it's not the same as my thing. And commit to leaving here shinier and saltier than you came. Are you, are you willing to sign up for that? I heard one amen. 
The rest of you guys just pensive. I have a very, by the way, for y'all, I have some really smart people in here. And they just, they, they, they get pensive, they're thoughtful, and they mean what they say. So sometimes it takes them a while. Takes them a while, but, you know, yeah, pastor, I'm with you. But they're not just going to say yes because I'm the pastor. They're not, gonna, they're not just the call and response, you know, that comes really from Africa. Huh? There's that cadence, call and response. They're not just doing it for the cameras. They're not just saying it to make me feel good. They're not going to sign up unless they mean it. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we're just going to talk. Let's just look a little bit briefly. And we do have, we're going to go to the word in a second. You know, why do we choose to be bland Christians? It is a choice. It doesn't happen to us. How, why is it that we choose to cover up our light, hide our light? Amen. Amen. And so the goal this morning is, is just to be real on this topic. Can we just, we're just being real. We're not beating up on anybody. We just, well, we're going to look in the mirror and let it, and be honest about what we see in the mirror, right? And then we're going to say, oh, you know, wait now. I used to have hair, but you know, I used to pat it down over here, pat it down over there. I missed the spot. Let me get that. That's all we're doing this morning. Are you with me on that? Amen. That's all we're doing. Hallelujah. We just want to walk away with some clarity and some commitment. A commitment to real change, to being better, a little shinier, a little saltier. Is that all right? Amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to title this message, Choose to Shine. Choose to Shine. The world needs our light, but it's a choice because you can hold back, you can water down, you can leave out. You can not do what you should be doing. You cannot say what you should be saying. You can not manifest and be the person that you should be. You cannot say yes when you should say yes. And so we want to choose to shine this morning. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. I thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to be used of you, Lord God, one more time. Thank you for the activities on my limb. Thank you, Lord God, that I don't feel one pain. I don't feel one. I, not, I, Lord, thank you for the miracle. I thank you for this place, Lord. I thank you for your purpose. Hallelujah. Some people go through life without a purpose, Lord. I know exactly why I exist. Thank you. And I thank you for these people. Lord God, I ask that you would speak through me, touch your people, because you know exactly where they need to be touched. You increase while I decrease. Thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. You know, Pastor Trina really gave quite a bit of voice to this point that I'm going to make. The landscape of faith and religion in the United States is rapidly changing. Amen. Have you noticed this? Amen. Did you know that there are far more people than ever that call themselves Americans who claim to either have any religious affiliation specifically or they're atheists at this point. A huge chunk. This it was a couple decades ago, 90% of Americans identified as Christians. No more. Often, I'm not affiliated with any religion or they're actual atheists. That's what we're working with now. So it's not the same as it was anymore. But because of that, do you think it's, it's more critical that our light shines? It is more critical. Yes, but it's also what? Harder. It's more critical, and yet it's harder. And that is what you were recruited into when you said yes to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So it's even more critical that we let our lights shine the way that they should. But we're just going to acknowledge this morning that it is harder and riskier. And I could point out lots of things. I could point out laws. I could point out what laws that become specific regulations that are HR and otherwise. When you're on your job, amen, you would think that the higher you go up on the ladder, the bigger the platform, the more you can give voice to Jesus. But you got to know how and when to do 
do it. But that's not licensed to not do it. Come on now. Come on now. Because we can hide behind it. We can hide behind it. We can cover up that light with a bushel and have a rationalization for doing so. Are you hearing me? It's harder, but yet it's more critical. We need you more, even though we're inviting you to a tougher task than it used to be. And even if you plan to go into the ministry and hope that you can make a living at it and not have to work a second job, I'd rather make tents. I'd rather make tents. It's not as easy as it used to be because folks left the church with the pandemic and they did not all come back. Come on now, so that gravy train ain't so gravy. But when we are shiny and when we are salty, the world gets better and Jesus gets the credit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen, amen. And, and our society is not so much into Jesus getting credit anymore. <laughs> there was a time when, for a brief moment, and Tim Tebow got a, some of the credit for it because he really made it popular, the John 316s in the audience in the, at the football games, right? When was the last time you saw one? Our society is changing. They need us more than ever, but it's harder for us to shine. Our society is changing. They need us more than ever, and it's harder for us to be salty, but there is no excuse for not being bright and shiny and salty. Amen. That's simple, but it's a challenge. It's a challenge to you. It's a challenge to me. Hallelujah. Just want to pause and acknowledge the fact that it's hard. I'm about to ask you to be better in an area that's hard. I'm going to ask you to do more in an area that's hard. And you know what your hard thing is. You know what your topic is. You know what you've been holding back. You know what you've been not doing when you should. You know what you've been watering down, pastor. But you don't have to be a pastor to water it down. Come on now while we, while we pull out that club. Yeah, them pastors. You got something that people need and you've been holding back too. You've been justifying it based on HR rules. You've been justifying it based on all kinds of stuff, right? Making up the fact that you don't have an opportunity. And it's like, there's 24 hours in a day. What you doing with them? Come on now. You got opportunity. Are you, on, are you on the computer? Are you on your phone? How long do you spend on Facebook? How often do you scroll? How much are you looking at YouTube? How, come on. You, come on. People always do what they really want to do. Even when it's inconvenient, even when they don't feel like it, but they do the thing that matches with the thing that ultimately they care about the most or the thing that allows them to avoid the pain that they're trying to avoid the most. So it may look like, oh, they're tired, but they're doing that anyway. Well, because the person that they're doing the thing for trumps their tiredness. The accolades that they get, amen? Whatever it is that they get, whether it looks good, or whether they look tired and it looks hard. Ultimately, they're doing it because something trumps not doing it. Something, someone, some purpose, some meaning is at the top of the food chain. That is why you end up doing every single conscious thing that you do. Not the breaths that you breathe because they're automatic. Not the heartbeats that you have, those are automatic. But the conscious actions you do because all the other things you could have done or not done are trumped by a reason, a purpose, a meaning that you deem at that moment is supreme. All we're saying is, can Jesus be at the top more often? That's all I'm saying. You're not going to be perfect at it. It's not going to happen all the time. But you know the area and the opportunity that you have to improve. Pastor Mike doesn't know it. I'm a mouthpiece. I'm speaking for Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We do have some word. We do have a text. Let's go to the book of John. Did you notice we're still in the book of John? Uh, And we'll go to chapter 12. And then as you go there, this portion of the book of John, uh, Jesus is alluding to his death a lot, a lot. Because the time is very near. And if you look at chapter 12, there's several chapters left. But one way or another, with a few pit stops here and there, everything's pretty much 
building up to that great moment, that ultimate sacrifice, that act that makes your life worth living, that act that gives you purpose and peace. That's what time it is, and Jesus is making that clear. And if you go along and you get to verse 35, you'll see that he urges those who are listening to him to embrace the light while they can. Embrace the light while he's still around because he's talking about himself. But then as he says that, uh, and, and in verse 36, he says, while ye have the light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of the light. And we're going to pick it up now at verse 37. And it reads this way, but though he had done so many miracles before them, meaning in their presence, they had seen Jesus with their own eyes perform many miracles. Yet what? They believe not on him. You could say believe not in him. They did not believe. And we're not even asking that they totally understand everything about why Jesus was there. Because even the disciples struggled with that all the way up to the end. They did not understand. They heard him say he was going to have to die, but they did not fully understand where he was coming from until after the fact. But at a basic, bare minimum, these largely Jews were expected to realize after all that Jesus had done, who he was. That he was the Messiah. He was the Yeshua HaMashiach. He was the son of God. That was the basic minimum expectation. And the Bible says that though he had done so many miracles, you would think they say, oh, you know, come on. Because we talked about last week. He was more than just an amazing man. He's more than just an anointed prophet. He was God himself. He had to be. Four days dead. Rigor mortis, liquefied, you can't turn around from that. You have to be able to make something from scratch to make that work. Amen. Come on, give, give the Lord a hand praise. Amen. Not Pastor Mike. Not Pastor Mike. We're talking about the creator. Amen. Amen. He waited two days just to show y'all who he was. I'm going to wait longer. I'm going to do nothing. So you can, so I'm going to show you. If he did that with your breath that you breathe in your heart, be, you'd be dead. If he said, you know, I'm going to show, I'm going to let them see what it's like without me. I'm going to see, I'm going to let them see. They've been complaining. I'm going to let them see what it looks like when I lower that hedge. I bet they won't complain about the same. They may complain. They won't complain about the same things and they won't complain as much. So that they could see, we could see who he is. Really, amen? amen? So many people, I mean, Jesus had given sight to a man who was blind from birth. That was like, whoa. And he had raised Lazarus after being dead for four days, and still that was not enough for many of them to believe. And as bad as that sounds, though, what John chooses to say next, notice, as bad as that sounds, he says, actually, that was expected. It was predictable. Don't act surprised. Don't be all brand new. Did you read your Old Testament? I mean, you look at Isaiah, you know, chapter 53, and you want to talk about wounded fraud transgressors. You want to make it all about your healing. Did you read the whole thing? So let's go to verse 38. This is what John says. He says, all of this happened. He says, after all the miracles that Jesus did, they did not believe in him that the saying of Esaias, which is Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled. So it seems sad. It was disappointing. It was upsetting. It was unfortunate. It was not a great thing. We wouldn't celebrate somebody not paying attention to Jesus, not believing Jesus, not really hearing what he was trying to say. But, but it says that the prophet... The words of the prophet, the saying of the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
Verse 39, therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah had said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes, even though there was plenty to see, nor understand with their heart and be converted. And I should heal them, which is the ideal, right? For them to see, to realize, open up their hearts and be converted. That would be the ideal. But according to Isaiah, it was prophesied that they would not. Usually when we see this, we're thinking of it as a way for the Gentiles to swoop on in there and be engrafted into the family. That their denial, the Jews' denial, makes room for the Gentiles. Jesus was. All God was always going to make a way for the Gentiles to come in. Amen? Amen? But that's what we usually think of. But in this context, you get to see that what he's saying is, you know, it should have been different, it seems, but it could never have been different. Because many of them, not all, were blinded so that they could not see. They would not understand and be healed. Are you reading this with me? And verse 41, these things said Esaias, meaning Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake of him. What is all this saying? This is John chooses to say all of this. He was inspired to say all of this in order to say that this was predictable. And so unbelief, just like the poor, you will always have some poor. But unbelief was inevitable. But it wasn't the whole story. Unbelief, he sets you up. He's pointed to what it could be like. He's telling you that it's not like that. He's telling you why, but he ain't done. He's telling you all that to build up to something. Unbelief was inevitable. But it was not the whole story. This world out here and the way it's going toward hell was inevitable, but it's not the whole story. Insert you. You want to let let that be the whole story? We want to just talk about it? We want to pontificate about it? We want to complain about it? Or do we want to insert you? So this is why John pivots from the inevitability of the unbelief. He pivots to highlight Shining the light, I got a spotlight on believers now. Uh huh. We could talk about the world. We could talk about how it's going to hell in a handbasket. We could talk about how all the mores are changing. We could talk about the fact that our money says in God we trust, but we really don't. We could talk about that. But I'm shining a light. I'm shining a light. I'm shining a light on you this morning. Amen. I told you it'd be simple but challenging, and we all have something that we can get from it. This is for all of us. So that's going to be our focus this morning. Let's continue on. I don't have home, just so you know, Pastor, how how much longer you got? I don't know how much longer I got, but I have two verses. How about that? I'll tell you that. I won't tell you how long it's going to take me, but I'll tell you I have two more verses. And so we go to verse 42. After he's just said these things, it said Isaiah, when he saw his glory, meaning that of God, and spake of him. Nevertheless... Among who? The chief rulers also what? Many believed on him. Now my students, those who pay attention to the sermons, those who are here and not just showing up, but paying it, really grasping this, this might sound familiar because it wasn't that long ago in chapter 5 that we had some folks who believed on Jesus but weren't really ready. To follow him. That were quickly offended. As soon as he started telling a little bit more of the truth. All he had to do was say you needed to be spiritually changed. And they're like what? Uh Uh-uh. My father's Abraham. What you talking about? Didn't take much. But it's important for us to understand. This is not that. This is, these are, these are not those spirit, those religious leaders that had a superficial belief in Jesus but didn't want to follow him. These really 
actually believed. And, and there's a subtlety here that we might not pick up on, but, but, but when, he, when he says uh, 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 chief rulers, he's not just talking about religious folk. He's talking about people that are part of the Sanhedrin court, the highest group in the land, the most powerful group in all of Israel. He's letting you know while unbelief was inevitable, they had some heavy hitting believers. Is what he's trying to let you know right now. Are you hearing him? Amen. Two quick examples that you know of, but you might not have made the connection, are number one, Nicodemus, the guy who came quietly, privately at night and to ask Jesus, you know, what's this thing all about? And then he said, how in the world can I go in the womb, out of the womb, and back into the womb? And out of the, I don't understand it. And it led up to, for God so loved the world Amen. that he gave his only begotten son. Come on now. That Nicodemus was on the Sanhedrin court. That Nicodemus was one of those chief rulers. And then we have Joseph of Arimathea. That one who was part of the Sanhedrin court. One of the heavy hitters that quietly but intentionally and thoughtfully asked for the body of Jesus. When he was taken down on the cross to ensure that he had a place of dignity to be laid. He was one of those heavy hitters. And yet when it came time to make sure that our Lord and Savior's body was taken care of, it was one of those heavy hitters that truly believed, not superficial. This is to draw a distinction from those jokers over there in chapter 5 that wanted to debate with Jesus. Are you with me? So John was just making the point that not only that were there many who did believe, once we finish with those who believe in something else, some other God that's not really a God, <laughs> right? Those who don't believe in anything, they're secular humanists or they're atheists. And when we finally get down to the believers, there were many of them and they were heavy hitters. But believe in Jesus is a good thing, but it's not enough. Just believing in Jesus, this is not me saying it, I'm telling you in advance what he's about to tell you. It's not enough. What did they do with Jesus? What did they do with the belief? It's not good enough to just say, you know what? I believe in my heart. I have him in my mind. He, he's my God, and I don't have to prove anything to you. No, you don't have to prove anything to me. You should prove it to him, and I just watched the movie. I'm just watching while you prove to Jesus how grateful you are. I'm just watching while you show God that you know that he is really God. I'm just watching your movie. So what did they do with him? We continue to read. He's already said, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, there were many that believed on him. This is important. Imagine the Sanhedrin court. And there were many of those chief rulers, movers and shakers, who believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they what? Did not that's him. These are heavy hitters. These are some bad boys. But because of the Pharisees, these are people that are not superficial and don't really want to follow Jesus. These are people that are not, you know, arguing with. These are people who really believe he was who he said he was. But because of the Pharisees. They would not confess him. So you swoop on down and you just take Pharisees and you erase Pharisees and you plug in whatever your thing is. Ha ha. Because of the Pharisees, they would not. They've seen the miracles they bought in. But because of the Pharisees. They believed in Jesus, but were unwilling to publicly acknowledge and share their belief. Why? 
because the Pharisees were the dominant group. The Pharisees, while there were many of these dudes, the Pharisees outnumbered them. Amen. The Pharisees, remember, we've talked about this before. The Sadducees, that sect that didn't believe in any kind of bodily resurrection, they dominated the chief priest role. But everything else and the people in their minds and the details of day to day life and religious life were dominated by the Pharisees. Are you hearing me? Amen. Hallelujah. They were the dominant group outnumbering the others, and they control the religious practices. And they were a super majority in the Sanhedrin court. You can think of it as, you know, our supreme court, if you will. Amen? Amen. And now we move on. So we see here that there were some heavy hitters that believed, yet they stayed quiet about their belief because of the Pharisees and they did not confess him and then at the end there we see lest they what should be put out of the synagogue that's a pretty big threat right but it was a real threat because the Pharisees ran things when it came to that the Pharisees threatened this, and it was a real threat. And anybody claiming that Jesus was the Messiah, anybody claiming that he was the son of God, would be kicked out of the synagogue. They would be excommunicated. This, by the way, is the reason why. Remember the guy who got healed, that Jesus healed, who was blind from, from birth? Well, I don't think we covered this during the sermon, but his parents came along and they, they, that, no, they went to the parents and said, no, we don't believe this. This is hogwash. They went to the parents and said, is this, is this your son? Yeah, this is our son. Okay. Was he really actually, is this live or memorex? Did he, re, was he really blind at birth all the way from birth? Yes. But this, what I'm telling you about is the reason why they said, yes, I can vouch for that's my son. Yes, I can vouch for the fact that he was blind from birth. But anything else, he's of age, you talk to him. Because I'm not going to get on the witness stand and say anything that might be construed or perceived as me even halfway tangentially saying that Jesus was great, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was the son of God. You talk to him because I don't want my words to be twisted. That's how serious this threat was and what you now see is that it didn't matter if it was just the parents of the guy who was blind you could be one of the heavy hitters but you're going down if you slip up and talk about Jesus as Lord if you slip up and talk about Jesus as Messiah huh if you slip up and start talking about he's the son of God and so as you talk about him how can you really talk about him without letting that slip out so you say nothing you keep it to yourself you make your belief private. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. So being excommunicated was not just a, a loss of religious connection. You actually would lose your ability to really fully involve yourself in the community. And in some cases, it also would affect your ability to relate fully to your family. This was a real threat. Are you hearing me? So there were many who did not believe, and it was prophetically known that it was going to be so, but yet there were those who did, and there were heavy hitters, and even though they were heavy hitters, they withheld, they watered down Jesus in their life. They watered down their testimony to the point of not telling it at all for fear of losing something. This threat was real. It was enough to silence real believers. Are we exceptions to that? Or do we dabble in it a little bit? Maybe more than a little bit. And yet, everything I just told you, the Pharisees and their threat, the real threat, we could point to that. That's the problem. It's the laws. That's the problem. It's the regulations. That's the problem. It's society. That's the problem. 
It's our economic system, that's the problem. It's prejudice, that's the problem. We still haven't gotten to the real problem yet. Come on, come on with me. Now I'm on my last verse, not my last words, but my last verse. For, meaning because, meaning he's about to tell you the reason, the real root cause of everything he just told you. In case you see all of that other stuff, all oh, those Pharisees, oh, they were terrible. Oh, my God, that's the shiny penny that you want to look at. No, 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 no. Because for they refused to say anything about this amazing Jesus that they'd come to believe in. For they loved the praise of men more than, did it say none? Not at all. Did it say never? No, it didn't. It said more than the praise of God. More than. How often, oh, I love Jesus. I'm down with him. Yes, I'm called. Yes, I'm grateful. But at this moment, something else matters more than. I'm still breathing his breath. My heart's still beating. I didn't have to try to do it. I woke up this morning, not because of the alarm. Oh, but something else while I walk around with his limbs, something else is more than my ego, more than embarrassment, more than my finances. I'm saving up for this. This was my plan more than. I was done with the medical school. All kinds of things had happened, but more than. Now, this is the core issue. We finally got there. We went on a journey together, and we finally got there. This is the real core issue. It's not the Pharisees, it's not the laws, it's not the problems, it's not the people, it's not the structure at work, it's not the rules, it's not HR. Yeah, no, it's, it's they loved the praise of men more than they loved the praise of God. That word praise in the Greek, oh, I got slipped some Greek in there. I told it would be simple, but it's simple Greek. Doxa, D-O-X-A, that's just one word, that's it. Just one word. It means praise, it also can mean honor, it could also mean renown. Renown, where you get all this beautiful credit heaped up on you, right? These men, we talk about first world problems. They had first world belief. <laughs> and they had first world reasons. Sometimes our reasons, our excuses are first world excuses. They had far too much to lose. Come on now. Come all the way there with me. Come all the way there with me. Come all the way there with me. Because in, throughout history, most of the people that really believed Jesus didn't have a whole lot. One of the reasons why the slaves adopted Christianity wasn't because the white man's religion seemed so right, but they were so desperately in need. That they embraced it. Then they figured out why they needed to embrace it. Are you following me here? But now we have first world lives in the United States of America. Our poorest are better off than many other places. You know, folks who are not considered poor. Amen. Amen. So we have first world things to lose. So then we have first world reasons and excuses for not letting our light so shine, for not being the salt of the earth. First world excuses. How do we know they're excuses? Because the Bible just took, John just gave you a great example. These folks, it's not that they didn't love God. It's not that they didn't believe in Jesus. But they loved the praise of men. They loved what the world could give them more. I'll keep on, I'll go all the way to say, come on now, pastor, preacher, missionary, whatever you are. Loved what the church could give them more. 
than what makes God happy. So then when you're in that position, it's rather logical, if not easy, to water down. It's logical to water down. It's wa logical to push aside the truth that is inconvenient and unpopular and societally untimely for what is convenient and popular and frankly brings you a lot of money <laughs> and fame. It's logical. You're going with me, aren't you? So whatever it is that society or even church gives you Does it end up having enough value that it seems worth you being silent? Worth you holding back on God? Worth you not doing and saying everything you're really supposed to say the way you're supposed to say it and giving him credit as being your inspiration, your reason, your source? Is it worth watering down the great word that you get to preach in his name? Get to watering down Jesus, minimizing Jesus, cutting out Jesus, singing songs and never saying the word Jesus, leaving it out so you can cross over. Do you know where you're crossing over to? Or compromising his truth. Manipulating it, massaging it, so that it's palatable. So that it's palatable. You have to be aware of the times that you're in, but be careful about how you contort the word to make it palatable. How you contort your calling, your ministry, your message, so that people can receive you. You should be thoughtful, you should be wise, but beware. Your calling and your assignment are critical. Don't go too far in compromising it and Jesus along with it. Amen? Amen. And so we, you know, we hurry through life, the busyness of life, this first world that we get to live in. And we typically avoid these kinds of questions. Rush, 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 rush. Busy, 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 busy. Work and kids and this and that. Sometimes it's even ministry. We do ministry like that without ever saying, whoa. You know, am I really doing everything? I'm, am I really shining or am I just busy? We avoid questions like this because we're too busy to stop and look in the mirror, stop long enough. So whatever can reduce your witness for Christ, it's either pretty threatening or pretty important to you. Whatever your things are are your things. We're just trying to get you to leave here shinier and saltier than you came. And we might say, well, we confess Christ. What do you mean? I'm not denying Christ. I don't, I don't fail to say that Christ is who he is. But you're still holding back something. You're still not saying something. You're still watering down something. You know what your thing is. You know how much work you still have to do. I know how much work I still have to do. You know what your opportunities are. I know what my opportunities are. And all those things, we pass on them. We water them down, hindering our light and dulling down our saltiness. Individually and collectively, is it worth it? Is whatever it is that you get from that position, from that reputation, from that job, from that community, whatever it is that you get, is it worth it? Is it worth what you receive? And is it worth it for the damage that it does to the kingdom when you don't show up shiny and salty? My only ask today is, is that you're honest with yourself, that we are honest with ourselves about this, right? And that we give this issue some quality attention beyond these doors. And that you think about this and, and, and take some sort of action for change. 
I know it's not going to be perfect. You're not going to solve everything. You're not going to address fully all of your issues, whatever they are. But what I'm just saying is that you do something to get better for Jesus. That's all I'm asking this morning. Not everything, but make some progress in the area that you know you have in your minds right now that I have no idea about. And so I want to thank you for, for going on this journey with me, doing this exercise of introspection and honesty together. Isn't it beautiful? Because we all sit in this bowl of neediness. We all sit in this bowl of infrafe. There are no big eyes and little use. We all can get and do and be better. And so I just pray that you leave here shinier and saltier than you were when you showed up. And I thank Jesus for the opportunity this morning. And so to God with that be the glory. Let's give the Lord a hand. Praise. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.